And I think one of the most important um, features of the modern world is that, in a sentence, Europe has so far chosen not to be our power. Welcome to the New Enlightenment podcast, a production of Adam Smith's Panmure House. I'm your host, Adam Dixon. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Paul Tucker, a fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School. Before taking up more scholarly pursuits, Paul was deputy governor of the Bank of England and a former director at the Bank for International Settlements. Paul joins me today to discuss, among other things, his recent book, Global Discord, Values and Power in a Fractured World Order. Paul, welcome. Well, it's great to be here. Thanks, Adam. Um, the reason why I wanted to have you on um, when we met at the Political Economy Club in uh, in London, a, a old, uh, long existing club, um, and uh, I learned about your your book and and realized that it was very much based on David Hume. Now. Behind me is a portrait of Adam Smith. I'm sitting here in Panmure House, which was Adam Smith's last home. And if there's any philosopher or thinker that Adam Smith really looked up to, it was David Hume. Um, sadly, David Hume died before Adam Smith moved, moved into Panmure House in 1778. Yet the spirit of David Hume um, was still with Adam Smith until he died. And I want to start with a, a question that your book raises um and then we'll get into a conversation about david hume and the scottish enlightenment and why it still matters today and you say how can the west and other constitutional democracies maintain their liberal traditions in the face of interdependencies with rising or revived authoritarian states in other words how do we cooperate because we share the planet with the likes of china and Russia. And it's in our interest that we don't go to war with powers that we don't have to. And we share so much of the planet that we want to trade and we want to be integrated and open to other places. But we have our own values that must be protected. And you're using your book, David Hume, to crack that puzzle and solve that puzzle, if you like, on how we cooperate. So I'd like you to say a bit about David Hume and his view of the emergence of cooperation um, and why then Hume matters still for this, the 21st century? Well, it's a wonderful question and it penetrates right to the heart of my book and indeed to my broader project. Um, first thing to say is Hume is a genius and that word should be used very, very carefully and rarely. Um, I still think in terms of philosophical disputes, more or less everything is still a dispute between Hume and Kant, mm -hmm. who awoken from his slumbers by, by Hume. Tragically, they never met. The one way into answering your question is that um, we're on a planet where there are other powers, and other powers have got different values, and we can't ignore that. And we need somehow to cooperate them without losing ourselves. Right. We, we, and actually, nor, we should, nor should we expect them to kind of lose themselves. And it's important to remember that. An awful lot of what I say is symmetric. Um, when people talk about these things over hundreds of years now, they tend to be quite reductive about it and boil everything down to power um, or interests or values. And the wonderful thing about Hume is that he, he knows that all of those three things matter. And he's both a kind of absolutely first rate social scientist, mm -hmm. political economist, and also a deep um, philosopher. So there's, there's, there's just no oversimplification. There's no kind of reductivism, which might be intellectually neat, but is going to leave you without a way forward. So if we assume it's just all cynical um, self-interest or raw power, we risk being blind to the role that values play in our own um, societies and in the societies that we, in some sense, are in a contest 
um, with. But if we think it's all about values, um, then we risk being naive and idealistic, and Hume avoids that. And it, and it Hume starts, for me, um, in book three of the treatise, which he wrote when he was about 25 or 26, it's quite incredible, um, with an explanation of how cooperation uh, works, and without wanting to get too technical about it. I mean, it's a story where we, small communities and then larger communities, face problems, face opportunities, and find ways through them, and maybe driving on the left or driving on the right, um, and we provide, we find ourselves, we find our way, we find solutions to these things, and some of these conventions that help us um, become internalized as social norms, and over time they become become habits that we value. They are both. I will behave in a certain way because I expect you to behave in a certain way because you expect me to behave in that way too. And suddenly we've broken out of the prisoner's dilemma where we're destined um, to choose suboptimally. And, and Hume does all of that um, without any of the formal language of modern game theory um, at all. And a century before, Hobbes has got some prisoner's dilemma type game theory in it. But actually, I would say not as sophisticated. Hume's got games within games. Right. And the best example of this is promising. So for Hobbes, you and I try to, um, try to cooperate. And the shrewd thing for each of us to do is to defect. And we end up in the bad cell of the prisoner's dilemma's matrix. So now we, reach, we, we enter into a promise with each other. Um, and imagine this is a promise about something where no one else cares about what it is we're trying to cooperate on. And in the Hobbesian world, it makes no difference that we've um, issued a promise to each other. We just break the promise and, and defect. But Hume's got a story of promising, oh, no, 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 no. No one may care about, no one else may care about the little thing that you were trying to cooperate on. But they care that you've broken your promise, Tucker. Mm. They don't care about the substance of the promise, but they care that you're a promise breaker. And, and humor's got games embedded in, in, in games in that respect. When I realized this quite a few years ago now, I thought, wow, I mean, it, you know, it took people have won Nobel Prizes in the last 15 to 20 years from that kind of stuff. This is, goes to the deep theory of institutions, this to name a name. Yeah. This is what Roger Meyerson does with his fundamental theorem of institutions. Um, and, but then, in a sense, that part of Hume is just opening up social science. And, Ad and Adam Smith takes that forward in a sense. And then there's this great bifurcation into kind of normative political theory and, and positive political science. But Hume is doing more, more than that. Um, as he talks about um, the, ver the artificial virtues associated with these conventions and ways of life, he asks himself at the end of, of um, the treatise, well, but, but why is any of this worth following? He says, well, actually, you have to reflect on it. Virtue has to reflect upon it, upon itself. And that idea of critical reflection, that um, in, in Anglo philosophy, that doesn't kind of really re-enter until the middle of the 20th century. I mean, this is kind of Habermasian and Habermas's exchanges with, right. with Rawls. It's the kind of Frankfurt school from um, after, the, after the war and a bit before the war, of course. Um, but it's the Frankfurt School without the radicalism. Right. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of prudent critical reflection that doesn't, that doesn't forget the kind of almost primordial value of order. That if, if, if we decide everything is, is worthless, um, then we could find ourselves back in the state of nature, if you like. So on, on Hume's... Uh, view of the emergence of cooperation. I mean, he was looking at it in terms of 
And I mean, this, and this reflects the empiricism of the, the Scottish enlightenment where they looked at actual experience and, you know, democracy or at least liberal forms of government didn't just appear because people got in a room and decided it, these, these developed over time and these evolved, um, but they evolved as part of communities. Now, how do you take that cooperate cooperative model, if you like, that exists within a community where, um, you know, think of Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiments, where it's, you know, I act because I I'm, I'm concerned about how others will perceive me and I want yeah. to be perceived in this particular way. How then that does it operate at the level of international relations between parties that have extremely different values, extremely different historical uh, experiences and in that different sense of what is convention, what is norm, um, yeah. what they deem as, as valuable. How, how, does, how does the human thinking work in that sense, that cooperative model in that? Through a, broad, through a broadening of interest, through a broadening of perspective. There's a sentence somewhere, I'm not going to be able to quote it accurately, where Hume says, well, as, as we enter into commerce, and he means commerce very broadly with others. So our point of view um, slowly starts to broaden because we start to kind of empathize a bit with, with their point of view and to understand it a bit. Now, this can be taken too far. Um, um, you know, in the run-up of the First World War, there are people that say, well, the German economy and the British economy are so intertwined now that we couldn't mm -hmm. possibly go to war. It would be crazy. And, um, but plainly, not only did go to war, but it was a very savage war that, in a sense, turned the world on its, on its axis. Um, but that doesn't make the original insight in the 18th century. I think that condemns the late 19th century enthusiasm for that point of view. Right. But I don't think it condemns to the margins the, the view of... Hume and Smith about commercial society, that it is broadening. Hmm. Um, and so it's a slow motion thing. Right. And I think this goes to our relations with China now, in that um, for some years I've thought, on the one hand, we really must de-risk, and so should they from their point of view, hmm. so that if, we, if, it, if it does come to conflict, we're not left helplessly vulnerable to them, again, symmetrically them to us, because I don't know, we get all our water from them or something. That's right, a kind right. of imaginary, um, example. Um, but in de-risking, which I wanted us to do, and we are starting to, to do, um, that can risk going too far, spiraling into a destructive protectionism, and it would be destructive in two, in a sense, two quite different ways. One is it would be a hell of a blow to the economy of the kind that we saw in the 1930s, which effectively led to kind of political dislocation that brought about another war. Um, but also it would, it would deprive us of this very benign slow motion um, force that doesn't bring about convergence necessarily, but that brings about um, a degree of empathy that help, will help us live in peace. Right. right. And I, I think that the, the Humean, Smithian perspective about commercial society is a, is a hopeful one mm -hmm. in slow motion, but not one that you can say, well, you know, we're, we're, I mean, the boss of Mercedes said a few months ago, according to the FT, um, and we couldn't possibly um, decouple. It's unthinkable for us to decouple from um, from China, and I understand why he said that. But of course, it's only unthinkable if it's if if actually it is thinkable for them to decouple from the United States. And yeah. that, I don't think that's what he was trying to say. Actually, I suspect that they just haven't thought about it very much. Right. Uh, right. Um, but you so there are all sorts of hazards in this, and the hazards are go in going too far. Yeah, uh, economic depression yeah. and and finding ourselves too far apart. But if we're too interdependent, then each side is taking 
and I care more about us, of course, and we're taking unnecessary risks. So I believe in, in judicious um, de-risking. So I'm curious how you would respond to the scenario or to the question where you can imagine in the Chinese case that the China hawks in the U.S. Congress or here in Europe, there's less of them here, or fewer of them here, um, they go too far. You know, and, and we see that the risk of that happening, um, at least in American politics, is very strong. We see the, you know, the banning of TikTok or the forced sale of TikTok. Um, and there may be very good reasons for some of these, some of these decisions. Um, sometimes I feel that Europe tends to be too naive about China um, for, for their own economic self-interest. But you can see also the Chinese, you know, and, and you can see that there's some reasonableness on both sides. Um, it's not in Xi's interest and in the Chinese interest to have a situation where they're completely cut off and vice versa. And you can see the Chinese and the Americans and the Europeans coming to an understanding over time where it's there's interdependencies, but they're less less strong than they used to be. Yes. Um, and there's that kind of understanding. How does it work then? And I can see this happening with China and um, the US and, and Europe. What about the intractable countries, if you like, or, 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 or are we just not trying to cooperate? So I'm th thinking about Russia, or we could even look at, you know, I would rather not get into the current conflict in Israel and Palestine, but, you know, these intractable where you think this is, they're never going to solve this, or is that just too pessimistic? And we should so kind I, of. I think there's an important, I think the Russian example is, is more important in this respect. And that I think the questions that matter most at a strategic level are with other great powers. And the significant thing about Russia now is that it is chosen essentially to place itself beyond the pale. And China has not quite. Right. I mean, yeah. But at the same time, um, what's happening in Ukraine can, without too much of a stretch, be regarded as the first proxy war. Right. In, in the sense that it would have been very difficult, I assert, um, for Putin to continue prosecuting it if China uh, had been in pretty much the same position as Washington and the big European um, capitals. Um, I, but China, other than that, and, and I think that's a big deal because that, you know, de-risking over shooting into protectionism and proxy wars where China's kind of a strategic actor, as it were, um, would all push us closer to the, um, to the Cold War. The, the other kinds of, of, of um, wars and things that go on around the world. I think at this level, quite apart from their intrinsic importance, depends on how they affect um, the dynamics of the balance of power among the big actors. China with Iran, China's relations with Saudi Arabia, um, Washington's relations with Saudi Arabia. Um, it's, you know, those, the tectonic plates um, concern the great powers. And I think you said something very important in passing about Europe, which is, you know, Europe, you, I think, I, I can't remember your exact words, but Europe can sometimes seem a bit too soft and prioritizing economics too much. I, I first agree. And secondly, though, at the latter kind of normative point, the, the kind of positive point would be, I think in some degree that's because Europe isn't a hard power. Right. And I think one of the most important um, features of the modern world is that, in a sentence, Europe has so far chosen not to be a hard power. I mean, getting from choosing to being a hard power to being a hard power is quite an essay's worth of yeah. discussion. Yeah. But, you know, in a sentence, it is not a hard power, but it is an economic power. Right. And, and, and it is, more it, recently, it, it's being pushed into being a hard power. And taught in that direction. Yeah. And I think that I, I talk about this in my book, Global um, Discord. I think, I think a dynamic where 
either initiated by itself or pushed a bit by the United States, Europe really did emerge again as a hard power. Yeah. So putting probabilities aside for the moment, yeah. I think that would be massive. Yes. And very complicating for the United States. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think something the United States needs to think about very carefully is pursuing a course where it effectively pushes Europe into emerging, re-emerging as a hard power, and then realizing that it really regrets yeah. that there are now two liberal hard powers in the, And um, then that would mean the US would have to listen to Europe now. Yes. Whereas now yeah. they don't. No, the equilibrium, the answer is I think that the US listens on some subjects yes. and less on others. And I think this is an equilibrium that has suited everybody really well. Crudely, Europe has more leisure and more of its national output goes into consumption goods. And America has more the prestige of power, um, less leisure, and yeah. more of its output goes into military goods. And so far, the value of prestige to the United States and the value of more leisure to Europe has sustained this um, post-Second World War yeah. equilibrium. It would be, and I think, I think this is one of the, this is in the, around the middle of the book that I argue yeah. this. I think sometimes people kind of forget, um, they kind of know how that happened, yeah. which is we wouldn't have survived without American power mm -hmm. and Soviet power um, in the middle of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. So we know the story of how this happened, but people, I think, can overlook just how wonderful it has been for mm -hmm. both Europe and for the United States. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, remembering my old life, which is more than a decade behind me now, um, very senior American people used to say to me, Paul, it's, you know, it's really irritating having, I don't know, five Europeans at this international table. And I, I'd reply, I always replied the same way, which was, I completely understand um, why you say that. But do remember, you, you really, really wouldn't like it if there were only one European at the table. <laughs> my point isn't that I want the world to change. My right. point is that I actually want people to understand the yeah. benefits to them of the world that they're in. So I, I'm, I'm, for those people that say, including um, candidate um, Donald Trump, yeah. um, that European governments ought to contribute more to NATO. I agree. That's yes. been my view for yeah. years. Um, but when he says, actually, you know, we're not going to defend Europe, yeah. well, then Europe's going to have to defend itself. The okay. United States should not, you know, make America small again. Yeah. Well, this is where, I mean, America, this is, if Europe yeah. becomes a hard power, that will yeah. end up being uh, make America small again. Well, but this is where I, you know, reading or listening to Trump's statements about NATO and the not defending Europe. And actually, when you when you look at the countries that are on the eastern eastern part of Europe, they're all the ones that are spending 2%. So, yes. you know, the ones that would be invaded uh, are spending the money. So so that's, you know, unless unless there was a flyover. Um, but I also, and I say this as someone who spent my entire adult life, um, here over in, in Europe, that it's, I try to tell people that, you know, uh, America in Europe, uh, is the West and America will never forget that. Um, and I'm, and I want to ask you in that regard, what is the West? And why does it matter? Because it's, it's central to your book. And, and I want to I want to frame this in a way, though, because increasingly the there are those within liberal democracies that look at the West and even even mentioning the West, it, it signifies that you're a racist imperialist. And, you know, we have this terrible history. Um, but now as a political message, you see the right. Um, or even the far right, they're talking about West, the West and Western civilization. And I think the left or the center is actually missing a trick here because they're, 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 they're allowing the West to be taken over by uh, one part of the political spectrum when actually it matters to the entire political spectrum. And so yes, I, I very much agree with that last bit. I'm not, I'm not a man of either the right or the left. Yeah. Um, the, there are lots of things to say about this. The first is, I, the way I think about the West 
is in terms of, of rich-ish constitutional democracies, rich-ish liberal republics. Yeah. Um, and so I counted that, um, South Korea, Japan, um, and some others. The, the, and to that extent, the, world, the word West doesn't do at all. But right. normally, I think quite the, the words free world um, I, I think they, it works in terms of what it describes. I think it doesn't work in terms of what it implies about everybody else, in that it's, it's not free world, unfree world. Mm -hmm. Everybody else is unfree. Only we, mm -hmm. the rich constitutional democracies, are free. Because actually, there are some not very rich democracies mm -hmm. that I think you can describe as reasonably free, but one hopes will become more right. free. So I don't, I don't kind of like free world as um, a substitute. Something I, I, I'll come close to your question in a second, something I ended up feeling very strongly about as I, as I finished writing my book, and it shows at the end of the last few chapters of the book, I think the way that South Korea and Japan in, in different ways have become rule of law, constitutional democracies, um, first of all, shows that you can become that while having a Confucian heritage. More importantly, it shows that you can become that without losing your sense of history and traditions and your sense of who you are. And I kind of celebrate um, yeah. that. I think that's been absolutely wonderful. Um, well, just look at, just look at how, how, you know, the most popular music in the West is K-pop no, exactly. and K-dramas. And, no, exactly. But Korea is able to export cultural products yes. because it is a, it's a democratic, open society. Yes. With but it, if, you, if you visit there, and I know Japan a little bit better than I know um, Korea, pe people still go to... That there is a Christian community there that's quite large, where people still go to their temple. Right. There are still um, great respect for ancestors there. There mm. is still kind of a, um, a Confucian sense of one's position in the world being through roles as well as some kind of post-Christian view of, or even Christian view of mm. um, each individual having their own relationship with the cosmos or their God. Um, and yet we share... Um, this. That's the first set of things I'd like to say. The second set of things, th those people within the West, and I now mean geographically the West, right. that um, um, it's really important that this is a long tradition of li liberal critique, liberal criticism from within liberalism. Right. Um, this, is, this is something that you cannot do everywhere. And there's a there's a absolutely you mentioned my reliance on David Hume, the other key philosopher in in both my latest book and the previous one is Bernard Williams, the late British moral philosopher who did some political philosophy at the end of his life. And in his last published book, right at the end, he says about truth, um, the 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 capacity of liberal nations. Um, to criticize in their way to finding truth is incredible, so long as we can survive it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's, I should have had the exact quote in front of me, but I'm not at home. Um, I think it's a tremendously important insight in that, if you like, liberal criticism of itself is absolutely part of our lifeblood. Right. But we do need to be able to survive it. Yeah. And, and that involves remembering that being able to launch those criticisms is a feature of liberalism itself. Mm. It also, it also um, requires always remembering what Williams calls the first political question, which is how on earth to achieve order and protection and safety and some degrees of trust and therefore the conditions of cooperation. In the radical cr critique is is, as the left would call it, I do think is incredibly useful, but not so useful if it's only got deconstructive um, right. consequences, because they can't be so 
deconstructive that actually we lose order and end up with disorder. Uh, another way of putting it is we do need to remember why the first political question comes first. Right. Which is that, you know, it is a political achievement that later on this evening when I walk out of this apartment block, I will feel completely safe. Mm. I'll go and buy some things in the supermarket, might have a beer with a friend, and I shall feel completely safe. And this is an achievement, yes. and it's a political achievement, and our television screens are full of parts of the world always where that's not true. No, and and not, that's... This isn't some kind of moral reward. No. This is a product of the kind of politics that in the 18th century Hume and Smith were that's talking right. about. Interestingly, it's not the kind of politics that Hobbes was talking about, mm -hmm. where order is maintained by an all-powerful wow. Right. No, I, I think that's, that's really important is, is you know, we, we take for granted the security we have. Yes. And that comes from a systemic level of security that if your goal is to abolish the system, then what are you left with? Yes. And, and this is where, I mean, for me, I, I will defend the right of a radical thinker to speak and to critique uh, just about anything. Because I actually find it very interesting to, yeah, I think it's important to have critical ideas because it makes you think differently. It makes you think, oh, maybe we aren't paying attention to this particular uh, aspect of social life or economic life. And, and, but then there's that sense when it becomes authoritarian yeah. and I have to agree with it. That's where I find it to be. It, it no, on the illiberal. These criticisms um, can be launched and debated and refined and ignored or taken up. Um, it's something that is possible mm. in the world of the West from the 18th century onwards, but not really so easy in China right, right. now. The same thing is that it's a bit easier in Russia than it is in China. Mm -hmm. The people at Navalny's funeral, that would be yes. less in China. Yeah. Wouldn't be so um, easy in many other parts of the world. I don't need to catalog them all. This is, no. um, it's, and the extent to which our world has been able to improve over time has involved facing up to things in our past. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's, it's, and this isn't new. Um, Catholic emancipation in Britain in the 19th century was a big thing. Jewish emancipation yeah. in Britain was a big thing. I was born in 1958. There was, there was still a kind of slightly anti-Roman Catholic thing yeah. in parts of England in, in 1960s Britain. There isn't at all any right. war. If one was a a Roman Catholic, 50 years would feel like a long time. I suppose if you're not, 50 years doesn't feel so much like a long time. And it, that kind of thing gives me, me hope, actually, that we are capable of facing up to that. And, you know, and it, it's been particularly awkward in the island of Ireland, particularly in the northern part. It's, but, but on the whole... Um, Criticism has been useful as long as people recognize that actually the capacity to criticize is, is something within liberalism itself. Right. And, and that's what religious... This is, this is what I'm describing, of course, yeah. is, the, is what one thing Kurt Goldstone calls the liberalism of the Reformation rather than the liberalism of the Enlightenment. It's a liberalism of tolerance rather than a liberalism of... By the way, I've worked out the answer... Um, you alluded to this earlier. Hume isn't a social contract theorist, nor am no. I. There isn't, some, there isn't some rational deduction going on here, which I'll, you know, I'll send you through the post. Yes. Uh, <laughs> that's not how it, it works. The way it does work is that we make mistakes. We make mistakes. We, we have to be, we're kind of capable of learning from them, sometimes painfully, slowly. So I want to move on to segue from the question of what is the West? And, and, and I like the way you, you put it, that it's not necessarily limited to some ethno-nationalist, geographically constrained view of what the West is, that it has 
it's the the it's liberalism i would say um in part that can be practiced in other places yes um that we don't think geographically as the west um in in underlying that in in your book you do talk about civilizations and civilizational thinking yeah and this again is one of those terms and one of those kind of that some would perceive as being we can't even talk about civilizations this was this is a completely socially constructed concept that was made by people to justify imperialism and forms of social repression that's not how you use it in the book but that's how some people appreciate yeah, yeah. a civilization yeah, yeah. how do you how would you handle critiques of your use of the term civilization why does it matter and then we'll follow into that about the issue of ideology in relation yeah. to civilization and civilizational thinking. Well, I think, first of all, I mean, I think that there is a very big difference from arguing, as some people do, that the, the West, and I now mean, again, the geographical West, have incorporated all sorts of influences from the Middle East and other parts of the world, which is plainly true. Yes. And, and and grippingly fascinating. And the same is true of the East as well. I think it's different from saying that to, and therefore we, we land in a place where you really can't make a distinction between um, the, the culture norms and institutions of, of the West and the culture norms and institutions of the East. I mean, Confucian China just is different from are from Greco-Roman, Judaic, um, Western world, mm -hmm. notwithstanding the flow of, of influences in both directions. And actually, I rather think that's something to celebrate. One of the mm -hmm. things I first did as a young man um, with a backpack, and probably until I was about 30, is travel in all sorts of places. I, was, I, I backpacked around China in the early 1980s. Um, mm -hmm. I think before the Lonely Planet guy was out, well, definitely before. The did you Planet. get? Did you ever get kicked out of cities that you were weren't supposed to? Be I, you were you only allowed to go to certain cities. That's exactly right. right. Yeah. Um, I I kind of went around India. I went around the Middle East and, and Northern Africa. And these people were incredibly interesting, mm. partly because of the the different religions and systems of thought and traditions and architectures and iconographies. And wow, the world's an interesting yeah. um, place. And so I think in some senses that there's a sense of civilization not being a dirty word um, at all. The other thing is to say, and I alluded to this already, is that you can have a different civilizational background but actually share, share um, political institutions and some political norms, because that's exactly where the Confucian heritage constitutional democracies of the East are. Right. They have, they're, not, they're not suddenly drawing um, things in their past from, I don't know, Aristotle, because Aristotle isn't as an important part of their past as, it, right. as Aristotle is to us. But um, Zhongxi and Mengzi um, are more important to their past. And actually, Korea asserted itself against China in, in about 500 years ago, I think, as, you know, we're more purist about Confucianism than you are. That's right. part of the past. It's kind of incredibly interesting. Right. Um, right. Unrestad has a really lovely small book about that. So I think that that these are all just ways of of kind of being interested in the different pathways of world history, and that doesn't at all preclude recognizing the influences um, that have travelled across civilizations. I mean, you know, a classic example probably is the Gothic Arch after the, oh. after the Crusades moving um, westwards. There's a marvelous caravanserai in the middle of Turkey, which is earlier than most um, French Gothic cathedrals, and it's got the most fantastic Gothic Arch. You, when you go there, you think, ah, that's because it may have come from here. Right. And I, and I think, you know, when we think of the likes of Adam Smith and, and David Hume, I mean, they were reading... Uh, I mean, at that time, you had more travel writings that were available, so they were yeah. learning about different yeah. parts of the world. They were reading, um, you know, uh, 
Adam Smith in his library had a, a copy of James Cook's um, Voyages. Um, you know, so they were interested in encounter. They were interested in understanding and comparing and learning about different parts of the world and their histories. And that, you know, so this, and, and also if you think about, you know, even European or Western history, I mean, the geography of it wasn't limited to the shores of, of this, of, of the Northern Mediterranean. I mean, it went down into to North Africa, um, well into the, the Near East um, at the time. And, and, you know, so when we, in the contemporary kind of uh, views of civilization, they often forget the fluidity of those geographies. Yeah. I mean, Byzantium is both a continuum of, of the Roman Empire in many respects, but also quite different from what happened in the, in the West, mm -hmm. because in a sense, the, the emperor is also um, the sponsor of the church. Right. The kind of, um, which kind of fits with the Tsarist tradition and also Caesar. And that fits with, I mean, one of, one of the incredible things I think about the contingencies of Western history is this bifurcation in, in, in power between the Holy Roman Emperor and the Papacy. Mm -hmm. and, they, and I fancy that in some respects, our tradition of separation of powers, now a secular separation of powers, find some of its roots there in that, not in any kind of logical way, but just we were, we, we have, because of the fragmentation of the Western Empire and the role that the church played um, afterwards, we, we come out of a, a world where we were used to fractured power. We were used to rival powers. Mm -hmm. Well, that's just not true in the history of China, just as it wasn't true in the history of, of Byzantium. Right. Um, so these are these are contingencies that might make a difference to the way we think. You know, who's really in charge? Oh, no one's. We can't yeah. say that one person's really in charge, and we end up thinking that's really wonderful. Right. And, and in places where one person really is in charge, they end up thinking that's rather wonderful. That's wonderful. So that then leads me to the question about ideology in mm. the contemporary. Right. So, on, you know, put aside the civilizational, yeah. but one way of comparing that is on ideological grounds. 2024 compared to 2004 or 1994, ideology matters again. Yes. I mean, I, the, for a long time, I, I, I thought the kind of whole end of history thing after the end of the Cold War was... The, the, the stuff of newspapers and journals. And right. I know I no longer think that, actually. Right. I, I, I think that mistakes made in the negotiations and construction of the World Trade Organization, which needn't contain yeah. uh, us, but I think it really do reflect that there was an end of history moment where a bunch of people that were in power thought that somehow our view of how to organize domestic governance and and international um, cooperation had prevailed forever. Um, this, of course, was a crazy thought at the time. And the best demonstration of this, if the people that um, are, are listening and watching this mm. take anything away from it, if they haven't heard of Document Nine, mm. they should they should um, look it up on Wikipedia. They that sounds Google. very sinister. Document it's document nine. nine. Document nine was was released or leaked. I think no one knows for sure from the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China in two thousand and thirteen. Mm. Um, so eighteen months or so after Li Dezhi became kind of more powerful, and it, it's a document that sets out seven no's, mm. and two of the no's are, 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 are and the seven no's are. If you like, I'm speaking approximately, but I'm capturing the gist of it, I hope. They're an instruction to the Chinese people. Mm -hmm. um, and perhaps I should say to Chinese people, not just to um, the people that yeah. are subject to China, but specifically <laughs> on Chinese people. Yeah. Right. Uh, and it's, it's really not to question. Um, first, the two no's are about not questioning um, the socialism of. of, of 
and the Chinese version of socialism and stuff like that, not mm. questioning the party. But the other five are more interesting in that they're basically no to all of our core political institutional values. So um, no to democracy, no to a free press, no to basic rights. Um, and actually, it's a very well constructed document. I can only mm. read it in English. I can't be completely certain of that. It's quite short. Mm. And, you know, I've written lots of public documents. And to say so much in so little space right. of such importance is, it's, you know, whoever drafted it is good at what they do. Um, well, but for us, yeah. but for us, it's really, really big. And I think it's quite, I say this in the book, I think it's, I, I mean, I'm staggered by this, really. I, I, I think it's amazing that this wasn't big news in 2013 mm. in the West. And it shows that the West was very slow to to um, to wake up to what was going on. And around the same time, I don't, I'm not going to get the dates exactly right, so I'm not going to one. Um, Li Zhi gave a speech, more in a domestic context, saying that the first weakness is always an ideological weakness, and if you if you lose the ideological battle, you end up losing all the other battles, and yeah. therefore we must buttress our ideological uh, credentials. So all this fits together and makes, makes good um, sense. But anyone that says, um, oh, there isn't an ideological struggle going on. I mean, I just don't know what they're talking yeah. about. I mean, there is. Yeah. It, the is. Question, I mean, and, and actually recognizing there is, is I think vitally important to recognizing the stakes. Yes. Which I think is about preserving our liberal way of and, life, and, and, it, and it gets course. back to it gets and, back and to... also, but also vital to navigating it. Right, exactly. If, if, you know, if one thinks it's just all about, it's it's not, um, it's not. I would say it's not like um, Britain's struggle contest with the Second German Reich at the end of the nineteenth century that eventually became the the First World War, in that. That was mainly about power mm. and about the room for them. Yes. Um, it wasn't very, it had an ideological element to it, but it wasn't ideological in capital letters. This, this, the Cold War was very ideological between the Soviet bloc and Washington and, and Europe and others. But that was different because um, Stalin walked the whole of his bloc out of the highways of the world economy in the late 1940s, early 1950s. And so when we think of the Cold War, lots of people kind of compare um, what's going on now with the Cold War, but it's different in the sense that the Cold War was everywhere, but it wasn't in everything. Mm. It wasn't in commerce. Mm. Little, little funnel for dollars and oil. Right. Um, whereas what's going on now, it's, it's everywhere for sure. sure. But it's in everything as well. And that's because we're integrated at the same time as standing off each other, both militarily and, and ideologically. I mean, it's, it's, I think the last time there was anything like this in a global scale for European capitals was the great contest between Britain and France, which lasted from roughly 1689 to 1815. Which is we could be at this for a long time then. Oh, I think so, and I, yeah. I wanted to bring in that point because I think you know Chinese economy may stumble around now yeah. or next month, and and people in Wall Street and the City of London are then going to say it's all over, back to normal. Yeah, and, and I don't think it's like that. I no. thought the most interesting thing in the recent kind of policy statements from Beijing was. They're forecasting growth of 5% this year, who knows whether that'll be right or not, mm. but increases in military expenditure of 7%. In other words, if you, if you normalize that where they move sideways for a while, mm. they, they could still increase their military uh, right. expenditure. It's all how you cut the pie up, right? You know, it's, yes, it's, it is. It but is. I think just you know, to kind of come back to, to Hume and the emergence of cooperation around those customs and norms, I and mean, that's where you have to have, you have to know what the ideology is. You have to know what they're thinking. Yes. Because then that's how we can come kind of to agree. And you, and you know, it really does. That my book ends by, by recalling a moment when I was in Hong Kong. Mm. 
And I'd lived in Hong Kong in the late 1980s. Um, um, and I'm in some hotel cafe, and at the next table, there are some Cantonese women, business women, doing some, I don't know, not quite a negotiation, but business talk. Right. And it, it just felt so like London. Really? And the Cantonese people are like London people. Yeah. And I, I read the book, and what I felt was, this is us, plural. But that's through commercial... That's it's commercial society. Through centuries of commercial things. Mm. So I have hope through that. But I don't, I'm not hopeful about the short to medium term. Yes. Okay. Well, I want to switch and switch gears slightly um, uh, to ask you about the United States of America, um, the country of my birth. Like I said, I've lived most of my adult life um, over here now. And I find that often Europeans, um, and I include the UK in that, um, don't understand American politics or American democracy that well. That doesn't mean that Americans understand their own democracy and their own <laughs> structures um, any better. But given that that you have, uh, you know, you, you spend time regularly in the United States, and you have sent have done since um, since leaving the Bank of England. Um, I'm curious what your thoughts are about American politics. You know, it's going, you know, this is an election year. Um, Europeans didn't understand the first Trump term. I don't know if they'll understand the second Trump term. They don't understand. You know, so I think, yeah. and I'm not saying there is going to be a second Trump term, but I wouldn't be surprised if there is. But, you know, the first Trump term, everyone thought it was going to be a disaster here. And so, oh my God, America's lost its mind. And we're seeing that kind of narrative come out um, again. So what I think, would you say to Europeans or people in Britain as well, this is what you need to understand about how America actually so, is. So before coming to the particular conjuncture, just on the structural basis, I think particularly for the European, the main European unitary states, Britain and France, it is, it's not instinctive to get one's head around the kind of federal structure of the United States, that states really do matter. Exactly. And that even municipal governments matter. But um, that's the first thing, that states can do things here. It's not so centralized. Whereas in the French system and the British system, you know, if you win in Westminster, you've won. Yeah. That's the first thing. The second thing, and I think Americans often misunderstand, it's misunderstand Britain in this respect. I'm going to come to Europe or generally in a second. Um, um, America has cross-sectional um, checks and balances. Britain has intertemporal um, mm -hmm. checks and balances. I want to dwell on Britain for a second. So there's going to be an election in Britain this year. Yes. Yeah. And at the moment, at least, it looks as though the Labour Party may have a clear majority. It may not have, but it may have a clear majority. Let's think about what that means. That means that they can control the timetable of the House and actually can potentially repeal every piece of legislation that the Tories put through now and in the past. And of course, that was true in 1979 and it was true in 1997, etc. For governments that get big majorities, and it's always been true. Yeah. Um, so actually, the really fascinating thing about Britain, the laws under which Britons actually live, are the laws under which governments choose not to repeal, even though they oppose them at the time. As far as I know, there's no political science on this. Yeah. But it is the single most important thing about the British. What laws do we live under? Yeah. Typically, we live under laws that the party of opposition at the time opposed, and then when they next got into office, didn't repeal. Yeah. And I find it, British politics much more volatile in, in, yeah, in, yeah. in American politics. It's very much trial and error. Things get tried out. Things get tried out and then discarded after a while. America's completely the other way around. I was in a, involved in a, um, a discussion recently where the point, one of the points I think you're reaching for came up, and they said, well, if Mr. Trump is elected, you know, the administration will do this and it will do that and the other. And I said, well, actually, of course... It will depend partly on whether um, the Republicans win the Senate and win the House, 
because um, in terms of getting people confirmed into the great offices of state and into all of the regulatory agencies, they're going to need Senate um, approval. And in terms of budgetary stuff, you know, the, the first mover um, thing lies with the House. So Europeans um, kind of need to be interested not only in who wins the presidential election, but who wins in the Senate and who wins in the House. I mean, last time, the most important, when, when Mr. Biden won the presidential election, perhaps the most important thing, other than that, that was very important in that election, was that the House produced a majority for the Democrats yes. only just, just, so that the kind of leftish element of the party were the veto players in the House. That was incredibly um, important. And so it, just at a structural level, I, I don't think one can c conclude much from who is elected as president. I do, though, think it's different this time from 2016 in one um, respect. Um, and I think this will bother um, not only Europeans, but people around the world, which is the, the, the kind of contesting the election mm. and saying the votes weren't counted where, I, you know, the authoritative view is not that at all. It's that the votes were counted and Mr. Biden did definitely win. Yeah. And that's held by, you know, Republicans of, of many stripes. I think that's a really big thing. We've talked about liberalism more than democracy, but, um, you know, the, for democracy, peaceful transfers of power Never. after after voting. I cry sometimes when I vote. Yeah. I think it's incredible that I can vote. I don't always cry when I vote, but sometimes <laughs> yeah. I vote. It's, I just think it's incredible. Um, it's amazing. And I think all that kind of your vote doesn't matter. I think it's rubbish. It absolutely matters. I, mean, um, I, I still vote in every single American election. Yeah. And, you know, even, in, I mean, some municipal ones that I'm allowed to vote for, I kind of, I feel bad about it because I don't, I'm, I'm not directly involved, but, you know, at federal level ones, or, or, or I certainly yes. feel feel part. And so I think when he challenged yeah. that, and the people and the people around him, and then you yeah. know not challenging it just for a bit and backing off. If you yeah. go back to Gore versus Bush, yeah, I mean, we can't spend much time on that. But I think that's a pretty bad episode too. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. So do I. Yeah. So do I. I don't remember it in the way you did. I didn't yeah. have a stake in it in the sense that I could vote or anything like that. Um, I think that was kind of a pretty grim episode. But Gore, the way that Gore put it to bed yeah. was really um, important. And I think I'm choosing my words carefully, actually. In the, um, so I think that's a big thing that is bound to make people more nervous about a second um, Trump administration. Something one kind of picks up here, I don't know how true this is, is people say, well, last time there were some kind of pretty reasonable people in the Trump administration. Yeah. But they're not going to serve this time. That's what I've heard exactly the same and, thing. And here yeah. I want to get to what I think is the really big point. And it's qualitatively a big point, but I don't know how to calibrate it. Yeah. I don't know uh, in the sense that this, which is that, as you know, as anyone American um, listening to this knows, that compared with, I don't know, 50 years ago, there are now many more positions around the White House the National Security Advisor, the National Economic Council Advisor. Um, and often those people are closer to the president than the people that are Secretary of State for this. Mm -hmm. And they don't have to go through... Um, a, a point with, yeah. A point, the confirmation. Yeah, yeah it's confirmation. And where that... That's just a fact. Yeah. There's nothing controversial about, about that. Um, the, the uncertainty is, of course, all, all states ultimately... Rely the, the executive branch is the only twenty four seven branch. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the key thing. It's and where that's very obvious in a British system, actually, it's still true in an American system. Right. The court, the court passes, the court issues pieces of paper. It doesn't enforce anything. The the Congress passes a piece of pieces of paper. It doesn't enforce anything. Right. Only the executive can yeah. enforce um, anything. And that comes down to the military and the police and all of those people. And 
you know, this is nothing to do with Mr. Trump whatsoever. This is to do with that ultimately a, a state holds itself together because if you like, those that can wield coercive power do so only within the constraints of the rule of law. And that, that's, that's just gigantic, actually. Yeah. I mean, and, 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 and some people worry about whether that will be different uh, this time. You know, the speech in the last week about there could be a bloodbath, and it was ambiguous. Right. And I don't know how it should be read, and some people have been worried by that, and some people said, no, you shouldn't be worried um, um, at all. But I, I, I think it's a bit different from 2016. Where I think all of this really matters, and this is not a point about either Mr. Trump or Mr. Um, Biden, or, or Mr. Starmer and Mr. Sunak, um, or whoever are gonna be the candidates in France, is that we're in a period of history where we need, our leaders just need to be kind of bigger and better yeah. than they needed to be for a long, long while. And that's not a comment on anybody, that's yeah. a comment on the times. The stakes yeah. have just got higher. When, you know, last year, when the, the Congress were flirting, so this is not at all a, a comment about Mr. Trump, um, were flirting with a default on the US debt. Mm. Um, I said to some commentator, um, well, vote for default, vote Beijing. Beijing would be, Beijing would be the beneficiaries yeah. of that. Last time when Mr. Trump was in office, and he was playing divide and rule with European states and complaining about the European Union, um, I commented again in public, that's Beijing's script. Beijing's script with Europe is the divide and rule. You see that in their relationship with Budapest and elsewhere. I've been in the room when Chinese people have said, we find it much easier to deal with European states bilaterally yeah. than with the European Union. And, um, <laughs> which, of course, in one sense, it's kind of trivially true. Yeah. But in another sense, well, you would, wouldn't you? Right, yeah, exactly. Uh, and I think people in Washington, whether from the libertarian side or the kind of national conservative mm -hmm. side or the progressive side or kind of center-left, they need to remember that this isn't like, you know, even 15 years ago, that they need to think through everything everything that's big through the lens of how will this be perceived in Beijing? And if Beijing is, yeah. you know, and that doesn't, that doesn't turn Beijing into an enemy, no, but, but, at all. but just be a little bit, one of the recipes of my book is, you know, try to avoid unnecessary self-inflicted mistakes. And actually, we haven't needed to care about that for a long time. Yeah. If we made mistakes, oh, well, elect a different government and correct it. Well, this time, they're actors outside. Um, that matter and are powerful. Mistakes, yeah. Well, on that note, Paul Tucker, thanks for joining me on the New Enlightenment podcast to bring back to the 21st century some of the most important thinkers during the uh, first Enlightenment, David Hume your new book, uh, Global Discord. Um, and hopefully, hopefully we'll have you at Penner House in person at some time in the future. Thank you very that much. That would be great. Thank you very much for talking to me. That would, that's lovely. Thank you. You have been listening to the New Enlightenment podcast from Adam Smith's Penner House. If you found this interesting, please consider subscribing and sharing. If you would like to learn more about Penner House, please go to our website, panmerhouse.org. Thanks for listening. And until next time.